Well, good morning, Helen Alliance Church and friends that have gathered around today to help us celebrate our Easter Sunday service. Many weeks ago now, when COVID-19 became a reality in our city and nation, many of us looked ahead to our calendars and we said, oh, what will Easter be like? Well, now we know what it's like. It's uh, me preaching to an empty room and you gathered around your television sets and other devices to worship with us. And I trust that God will speak to us through his word in the thoughts that he has put on my heart this morning. I love Resurrection Sunday because of the power that it represents. I like power. I like the feel that my engine is running well as I <clears throat> go up the mountainside and the car isn't dying as I get closer to top, but it has power to maintain the cruise control. I like the power of a baseball swing as the home run hitter crushes one in the seats. When I was much younger, I had a job part-time where we would uh, shovel out the coal out of old train cars and get them ready to fill them with uh, other products that would be shipped. And so we would be out on the track and we'd be shoveling out and suddenly another train would be coming by and my boss always had us get out of the train and we would stand alongside one train while the other one roared past us. Now, I don't know why he thought that was going to be safer if uh, the train had collided with ours, we were going to be in big trouble, but I did it because I was asked to, told to, and I always loved the feel of power as I would stand there and just inches away, this train would be roaring past at 50, 60 miles an hour. Ron and I frequently uh, have a discussion about watching Hallmark movies on television. And I usually tell her that I'd have a lot more interest if there were a few explosions or if somebody got shot or if there was some demonstration of power. So I like when I come to the scriptures on this Sunday and I read in Romans chapter 1 that Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Regarding his humanity, Jesus was the Son of David. But the resurrection showed that he was much, much more. It showed him to be Jesus Christ the Lord. Now in the scriptures, when the word power is used, there's two very distinct concepts. The first comes from the Greek word, which is dunamis, and we get the word dynamite from that, and it speaks of the explosive power or strength or might that someone has. It's the ability to do. Paul will later say that, that God has, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's the explosive power of dunamis. Exousia, however, is another kind of power, and that's the authority or the right to do. And God is sovereign. And as sovereign God, he is able not only to do what, what he, uh, whatever he wants, but he has the right to do whatever he wants. And in the resurrection of Jesus, we see both of those powers. Jesus Christ, the Lord, is the authoritative power, the resurrection, the explosive power. Now, it's easy to explain the distinction between these two. For instance, I have the ability to paint your house green, but I probably don't have the right. Or I have 50 customers who've called me and requested a yard cleanup. They've given me the right. But due to today's snow and other factors like how tired I get, I don't have the ability to do them all this week. In the resurrection, God is displaying both his ability and his right. He's showing his explosive power and his authority to act. There's no other entity in the universe that could contain Jesus in the grave. I like where Paul Peter says that on the day of Pentecost. In his sermon, he says that it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. I love that word impossible. Death did not have the power or the authority to keep Jesus from rising from the dead. 
make no mistake, if there was some other authority that could keep Jesus in the grave, then we should worship that authority. But there isn't. So today I want you to join me in looking at Ephesians chapter 1, 19 through chapter 2, verse 10. And I want you to see how Paul applies this truth. Now in this passage, he's going to have talk about both of the powers. There's the power of the resurrection and the power of the authority of Jesus being seated above all other powers. But this week, I want to speak specifically of the explosive power, the ability to do. And another time, we'll talk about his authority and his right to do it and the implications that would have on our lives. Paul is praying in this passage that the Ephesian Christians will experience the incomparably great power for us who believe, the power of God for those who believe. And he says that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That power is like the explosive power that God used to bring Jesus back to life and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Not only did it have the power, the ability to do, but it gave Jesus a position of authority. He is now seated far above authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only uh, in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, due to the lengthy description that Paul gets into of what God has done in Christ, sometimes we miss the flow of what he's, of what he's saying here. The verse begins by saying that Paul wants them to experience the power of God that was in Christ and in you, he now says. Do you, does that flow for you? He said, I want you to experience the power of God, and that power is like the mighty strength which he exerted in Christ and in you. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. The power is exerted not only in Christ, but in you. Now, Christ I get. I understand how God's power has been dramatically expressed in Christ rising from the dead. But how does... Paul point out that that power has been demonstrated in me. And he goes on and says, he says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them and at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Paul describes that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We know from other places in the scripture that when the Bible says we're dead, it's speaking of how we're separated from God. We are alienated from him. Another way to think of it is we're unresponsive to his voice and to his heart. And this is true because of our threefold enemy, the world, the devil, and the flesh, or our sinful nature. And all of those are spoken of here. We followed the ways of this world, he says. The godless society that is around us squeezes us into its mold. It it causes us to live by its values. It tells us that certain actions are okay. It teaches us to live in disregard and disobedience to God. And we follow the ways of the world. It also says that we follow the ruler of the kingdom of air, of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, or that would be the devil. And so Satan, in all of his conniving ways, is impacting and having influence on us. And he says we're gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Not only is it out there, but it's in us. The world is trying to push us into a way of living that is against God and 
his rule in our life, but there's something within us that's gone astray, gone awry. We have a sinful nature that is prone to evil, that uh, is easily led astray. And these three things were ruling in our lives, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we were dead. We were alienated. We were unresponsive to God. We were slaves to sin and our sinful nature. And then we read in verse 4, but God. God came to our rescue because of his love, because of his mercy. God, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, it says, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in its transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. I love that this verse has all three of those words that speak to us, that God is motivated by his love for us his mercy for us, his grace towards us. And he made us alive. He saved us from sin, its guilt, its power, its penalty. And he raised us up in Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Verse six tells us that. God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God made us alive, he set us free from sin. He raised us up with Christ in the heavenly places. And now we are God's workmanship created to do good works that he has already prepared for us to do. Friends, that's power. That's explosive, diamond-like power that rescues us from sin and gives us new life. Risen in Christ, we're not the victims of the godless society around us. We're not just puppets on a chain that Satan pulls at, uh, at his whims. We have the authority to live differently. Paul says in the book of Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This power lives in us. Paul says, I want you to know the power of God, the power that was in Jesus, raising him from the dead, the power that was in you, bringing you back to life, from sin and its destruction. And now he wants it to be an ongoing power in them. Christ alive in them, the hope of glory. Glory speaks of the transformation into our likeness of Christ. The hope of us becoming transformed, the hope of us becoming like Christ is Christ in us. This is heaven's hope, Christ in you. Heaven's hope. I trust you're knowing something, experiencing something about that in your life. Paul also said in Corinthians, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone. The new has come. And how does that happen? Well, he's telling us here. It happens by Christ living in us. The Christian life has never been about our own self-effort. It's not self-improvement. It's never been about trying harder or working at getting better. The Christian life is always about learning to depend upon Jesus, walking in close proximity to him, listening and responding to his voice. It's being alive to the Christ who's alive in us. And Paul wants them to experience this power. And I want you to know this morning, this is your hope. This is my hope, Christ living in me. All through the history of Christianity, the gospel has been changing lives. People have had the power to live differently. Their lives have been freed from sin. Habits have been broken. Destructive ways of living have been changed. Relationships have been changed. And this is heaven's hope. And so we found in the early believers, 
men like James and John who were known as the sons of thunder. They had a quick temper when one of the towns didn't respond to Jesus like they thought. They said, could we call down fire from heaven? That was their approach and attitude. John, by the end of his experience of living with Christ, is known as the apostle of love. Peter was more than cowardly. We relate to the ways he failed and betrayed Christ. But by the time he has been with Jesus and Christ is living in him by the Holy Spirit, he's now the bold preacher. Saul certainly knew of what he spoke of. He had met Jesus on the road to Damascus. It changed his life. He didn't try to get better. He didn't try to be different. It made him a different person. The power of Christ in him made Paul the defender of the faith. We each have our stories of growth and change. My father was pastoring a church. And there was a young lady in the church who was deciding to turn her back on the Lord and abandon her faith. My dad pleaded with her at the time to not give up her faith, to repent of her sin, but she refused. She went on her way and lived a very hard and difficult life. I met her many, many years later. She began to attend our church. And when I first met her, I noticed how hard her face was. The years of sin had made her countenance hard. And as each week she began to come and respond and God began to change her life, her face changed. She acquired a new compassion and mercy for the people around her. I personally know what it's like to have the power of Christ changing me. My wife will attest that it's a slow change, but a change nevertheless. When I became married, when I was married, and the mirror of marriage entered my life, I, I became aware of how arrogant I could be, how selfish I could be, how demanding and demeaning I could be towards those around me. I used to say I used up all my grace at church. And sometimes, sadly, that was the case. I was nice, pleasant, polite, patient with people. And then I came home and I had high expectations, demands, and was demeaning. But God has been changing that in my life. And for, to, that I'm, to him, I'm forever grateful. I relate to the person who said, praise God, I'm not who I was. But praise God, I'm not who I'm going to be. My resurrection message to you this morning is that there is more. There's more to be had in Christ and through Christ. Don't settle. Don't resign yourself to believing that you can't be more in Christ. It's easy to think that we or others will never change. Sometimes somebody will say to me something like, well, I come from a family of warriors. My grandmother was a worry. My mother was a worrier. I worry. That's just the way it is. I'll never be any different. No, no. The power of Christ lives in you. Fear, envy, lust, anger, bitterness, pride, hatred, independence, and a host of other sins need to be regularly addressed. They need to be continuously brought to the cross and then to the empty tomb in faith. I remember a vow that I made once to God when I was convicted of a sin in my life. I said, Lord, I can't promise that I won't ever do this again, but I do promise that I'll never tolerate it. I'll never be okay with it in my life. I'll keep contesting it with your power and the faith that you give me. I want to encourage you this morning to not become comfortable with some sin that, that exists in your closet, as if to think you could coexist Christ in your life on the one hand, well, this other thing continues to live out its secret life. Make your, your determination today to root it out. Paul also said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, if he had only said, I can do all things, I can do all things, that would just be false hope. 
That would be a form of humanism with its limitations. I can do all things. Well, I can't. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's Christianity. So I urge you this morning to exercise your faith. Often we don't need more faith. We simply need to exercise the faith we have. Learn to interject but God into your story. Yes, it's true you have sin. It's true that sin may have ruled, but that's not the end of the story. Ephesians 2, as we read this morning, is bleak. It's bleak of how we were living under our, the ways of the world and the God of this world uh, ruling over us and following the desires and sinful inclinations of our heart. That's bleak. But God, in verse 4, did something. Believe that he has done it for you, and that he will continue to do so. Now I want to add one quick thought. All these writings are to groups of believers. It's not just individuals who believe and are transformed. We're part of the body of Christ, and we need the gifts of other believers to counsel, to admonish us, to model for us, to encourage, to hold us accountable, to secure growth in our lives. So whatever you're thinking about this message this morning, think about how you can exercise faith, believe in God, and experience the power of Christ through the others that are in the body of Christ with you. In closing, I want to have you see this prayer of Paul in Philippians chapter 3, 10 through 14. And I'd like to pray it as we conclude our service today. Father, like Paul says in this passage, I want to know Christ. We want to know you. And we want to know the power of your resurrection. The mighty power that brought Jesus back to life and rose him from the dead. May it, Lord, exist in each of us. May it transform us change our character, change our parenting, change our relationships, change the way we handle our money and our time and our resources. May we know the power of your resurrection, the fellowship that comes from sharing in your sufferings, becoming like you in your death, and to somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Lord, we don't believe that we have already obtained all this, or that we've already been made perfect. Each of us knows that there are areas in our life that need to be addressed by your power. And so we press on to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of us. There is more for us, Lord, and we want to press on to experience it. We don't want to just drift through life. We want to be pushing forward to experience everything, all of the freedom, all of the joy, all of the victory that Jesus has for us. As with Paul, we say, we do not consider ourselves to have taken hold of it, but one thing we do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, we press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Lord, may each person here today listening experience the same power that brought Jesus back to life, the same explosive, mighty, dynamic power of God that has saved us and rescued us from sin. Now may it continue to work in our life and transform us into the glory of Christ. For Jesus' sake, and for a world that needs to see Christians in whom the power of God is changing them, we pray this. Amen.